Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Few aircraft have been more mysterious than the Lockheed U-2. Codename, Dragon Lady. This high-altitude spy plane was first introduced in 1956 and flew throughout the Cold War. The U-2 is capable of reaching altitudes of up to 80,000 feet and boasts a number of unique features that help it perform its dangerous secret missions. Because the U-2 is designed to fly in the upper sections of Earth's stratosphere, pilots need to undergo extensive preparations. In fact, U-2 pilots must undergo specialized training and physical conditioning long before they can qualify to fly the aircraft. Each flight requires the pilot to be assisted by an entire team of individuals, including doctors, support staff, and other ground crews. Due to the lack of oxygen at such high altitudes, U-2 pilots must wear fully contained, pressurized flight suits, similar to spacesuits. Along with the helmet, this suit delivers the pilot's oxygen supply and provides emergency protection in case of a loss in cabin pressure. Before each flight, pilots must report everything they did and ate the evening before to a military doctor. Once suited up, they must have 100% oxygen for an hour prior to taking off. This helps remove nitrogen from the blood and decreases the risk of decompression sickness. During transport to the plane, the pilots will use a portable oxygen supply, similar to a briefcase. The U-2's cockpit is extremely small, so pilots need assistance getting in and out. Fortunately, multiple personnel are always on hand to ensure the pilot gets what is required. While the pilot is preparing for the mission, an entirely different team is preparing the plane itself. The U-2 is notoriously difficult to fly, and a failure in any of the plane's many systems could spell disaster. Since missions can last anywhere between 8 to 12 hours, Pilots must be provided with sustenance to keep them flying. However, they can only consume liquid foods and water via squeezable bottles with long straws. This prevents the suit from depressurizing during flight. As with any other type of aircraft, both the pilot and ground crews will perform a series of pre-flight checks to ensure the aircraft systems, engines, and avionics are working properly. Only after everything has been properly approved will the plane be cleared for taxi. Unfortunately, takeoffs and landings are actually the times when the U-2 is most vulnerable. Because it's designed to operate at high altitudes, the plane does not handle well on the ground. Moreover, the small cockpit and cumbersome flight suit significantly reduce the pilot's visibility. For this reason, a series of lead cars are present to follow the U-2 down the runway and provide directional information to the pilot. This helps ensure a safe takeoff and reduces the chances that the aircraft will leave the runway by accident. Okay. 
The long hours in the U-2 have led to some pilots racking up impressive accomplishments. For example, Major Thomas Ryan of the 99 ERS clocked more than 2,000 flight hours in the aircraft back in 2009. Because flying this particular aircraft is so hard on the body, such achievements are quite rare. Still, some pilots simply become very attached to their planes and demonstrate a level of dedication that allows them to reach new heights of success. Since the Cold War ended, the U-2 has generally operated as a peacetime reconnaissance aircraft. However, as the United States entered new conflicts, the plane's mission would switch to emergency reconnaissance operations. Using high-altitude surveillance equipment, U-2 pilots were able to track troop movements and armory buildups throughout several major conflicts. They also assessed bomb damage from airstrikes and helped to monitor other occurrences, both natural and military. Throughout Operation Desert Storm, U-2s provided 90% of the Army targeting intelligence, 50% of all imagery intelligence, and 30% of the total intelligence. While it's true that the U-2 does not actually go to space, it does fly high and far enough that NASA has developed its own variant, the ER-2. Short for Earth Resources 2, this highly specialized aircraft serves as a high-altitude research platform. It's used for scientific investigations and Earth observation studies. Unlike its military counterparts, the ER-2 is not used for reconnaissance, but is instead employed for peaceful scientific purposes. Though it also possesses powerful camera and sensor equipment, it also carries state-of-the-art spectrometers, atmospheric measurement tools, and other equipment used to collect data related to climate, atmospheric chemistry, Earth surface activity, and more. One of the many ways the ER-2 has been able to serve the scientific community is by mapping climate change driving wildfires in places like California and Washington. In 2017, for instance, the ER-2 flew over Southern California carrying Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Averis spectral equipment. Short for Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, this device helps detect, identify, measure, and monitor processes of the Earth's surface and atmosphere. In terms of wildfires, it provides valuable insight into fire temperatures, fractional coverage, and surface properties, including how much fuel is available for a fire. ER-2 pilots have to undergo the same preparation processes as U-2 pilots. Fortunately, NASA is uniquely equipped to maximize safety for every mission. This is because NASA has been putting men and women into actual space for more than 60 years. The technicians and scientists who work at the Space Administration not only have the knowledge to ensure their astronauts and pilots make it back home, but the equipment as well. The International Space Station is one of the best examples of scientific cooperation in history. For countries like Russia, Canada, and the United States, 
The ISS serves as a space laboratory for scientific research and experimentation. The main methods of traveling to and from the ISS are Russian Soyuz and Progress spacecraft and American space shuttles. When operating out of Star City, Russia, American and Canadian astronauts will wear the Russian Sokol spacesuits. These state-of-the-art suits are pressurized, creating a bubble of air around the astronauts at all times. These suits also have hoses, which allow astronauts to plug directly into an oxygen supply in the event of an emergency. Soyuz spacecraft have been used since the 1960s and can get teams of three to the ISS in under six hours. The spacecraft consists of a spheroid orbital module, a small re-entry module for returning to Earth, and a cylindrical service module with attached solar panels. This contains both instruments and engines. During launch, the rocket puts out around 26 million horsepower, rocketing the team into space in mere minutes. Once in orbit, the Soyuz spacecraft performs a series of maneuvers to align itself with the ISS docking port. This process requires precision and is monitored closely by mission control centers on Earth. Once complete and pressure has been equalized between the two hatches, the crew can transfer from the Soyuz to the ISS where they can stay for up to six months. Typically, the most tense moment for the astronauts on the ISS is re-entry. This is because they must prep for this part of the mission independently, without the aid of ground crews, medical professionals, and other experts. To accomplish this, they must enter the Soyuz module, undock from the station, and perfectly orient themselves for re-entry. This must be done at a very specific angle, otherwise the spacecraft could bounce off Earth's atmosphere and enter deep space. Overall. Traveling via Soyuz to the ISS is a well-established and carefully planned mission with a strong focus on safety and reliability. However, it takes the work of a lot of people to make each mission successful. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.